Maybe that's because I pinned her. Can you hear me now? Oh. I think, I think you can hear me now, can't you? Keep talking. No. I could not hear you. I can hear you. We're both echoing with each other, but. Okay, I don't know what that's about. Okay, so are we just. Oh, we're in trouble, Phil. I'm hearing a lot of static. Well, we're using the phone and we've got feedback. We didn't have those, so let me switch to something else here. Yeah, break the break the path there. Is that better? Uh, not really. Let me see. Go ahead, talk. You turn the volume down. See if. You... Well, it's coming through here now. I think it's uh, coming through now, isn't it? Sounds like it. Mute your phone. Now talk. I'm going to turn my phone off, Donna. Okay. Yes. All right, now talk. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Now, what about the video? <laughs> your your I, screen. They said they could see me, but I can't see me. <laughs> so, don't worry about don't you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about you. Well, I, I just want to make sure. I don't care about seeing me, except that I don't know if I. If they got my eyes or my face or whatever. We get some feedback on how, if you can see her. We can see you again. If you talk again, we can see you. We can see the top of your head. My head? Yes, okay. Catherine. Is this better? Yes. That, is that a lot better? Yes. Okay. Yes. There you go. I think I got it now. Okay. <laughs> Just in time. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh crap. Wait a minute. We're happening? recording. We're all good. <laughs> well not yet. Now I got okay, now we're okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So, this is go what ahead happens now. when you have older people doing um doing technology. It's too funny. Oh my gosh. Welcome everybody. Um we have had an amazing turnout for this, um, an amazing response. We had over 480 people register for this event. Um, it is being recorded. I just wanted to let you know. I want to thank you for being here. Um, this is the book that Catherine wrote back in 2007. Um, she, it is available through Sopris West. Do not buy it on Amazon. It's $126 through Sopris, I think it's $31, something like that. So Catherine is joining us tonight. Are you there, my friend? Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so what we're going to do, uh, Catherine has about an hour presentation for us. And um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we will do a Q&A afterwards. And um, if you don't know me, I'm Donna Heitmanek. I am the creator and administrator of the Science of Reading, What I Should Have Learned in College Facebook page. Uh, welcome to this event tonight, everyone. And now I'd like to introduce um, Catherine Grace, with that beautiful name to you. Catherine Grace has had a wide variety of experiences within the field of education, ranging from preschool to adult learners in both regular and special education, as well as educational consultation. She has a Bachelor of Science in Elementary Education, a Master's in Reading and Language Arts, and a, and a Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study in Language and Learning Disabilities. She was extremely fortunate to study under Dr. Louisa Coates. I think that's Motes. Motes. Okay. And Dr. Yeah, Motes. Lyon. It says Coates. Dr. Coates was my baby doctor. <laughs> 
says, coach. <laughs> <laughs> Both experts in the field of literacy and teacher development. Louisa Motes doesn't need an introduction. She has created and presented workshops around the country in all areas of literacy, but especially those linking the development of reading and written language. She is best known as the author of Phonics and Spelling through Phoneme Graphing Mapping, which has helped both children and adults better understand the alphabetic principle. She is the founder of Learning Roots, a tutorial and professional development company in Vermont, where she continues to provide student assessment, intervention, consultation, teacher mentoring, and teacher development. We're so glad you are with us. Um, this is going to be amazing. Thank you, Dak. Thank you, uh, Catherine. And without further ado, it's it's your turn. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome everyone, and I'm sorry we got off to a rough start there. Um, I wish that, I mean, there's so many of you I can't interact with you individually, which is what I like to do. So um, write down your questions, and my understanding is there's going to be a question and answer period at the end. Okay? So here we go. Whoops, it won't let me go. Okay. So why do we study spelling? Um, having a knowledge about how English words are spelled, which is called orthography, can inform our teaching of phonics. A child's spelling provides a window into his or her understanding of the language, and word study should include this teaching of phonics, spelling, and vocabulary. Um, how many of you are able to look at a child's spelling and say, boy, he doesn't know um, this sound symbol principle or this rule? Um, I, after years of doing this, I can pretty much lo um, look at someone's writing and see that and see what skills they're lacking in. The correlation between spelling and reading comprehension is also high since both depend on proficiency with language. And that's not just spoken language. Remember phonics and phonology and pho um, phonemic awareness is all a piece of language under the language umbrella. The more thoroughly a student knows um, this language, the more likely he or she a word, the more likely he or she is to recognize it, spell it, define it, and use it appropriately. Spelling is most obviously connected to writing. Research has consistently shown us um, that, that poor spelling can adversely affect composition, transmission of ideas, and causes writer frustration and embarrassment. On the whole, students who spell poorly write fewer words and write compositions of lower quality. Writers who struggle to remember spelling often limit themselves to only the words they can spell. So people assume, or some people can assume, or try to assume, that if it's the child's lack of ideas, when it's really the lack of being able to put those ideas on paper at the same rate they're able to think of them. Non-automatic spelling drains attention needed for the conceptual challenges planning, generating ideas, formulating sentences, and um, one monitoring one's progress in both speech and writing. But is the English language predictable? For decades, people have believed that our spelling system had no predictability. And were they correct? They would say, this language is crazy. There's no way to make sense of the different way the words are spelled. And others would say, why do we teach the rules? There's so many exceptions to them. How can we ask kids to do that if we can't remember them? This, um, I don't know if any of you use the cast -a spell program, which was popular during 1993. It went crazy in Vermont and New England, and it was actually started by two teachers, not two researchers, I think out of Massachusetts. And the, the manual said this, the English language is made up of many words from other languages, Greek, Latin, French, German, Old Norse, Old Iceland, and of course, Old English and Anglo-Saxon. Since the English sentence structure can readily accept words from other languages, English has become a rich and versatile language, but does not have a predictable systematic spelling system. And it was, um, this book was written by Diane Fortenault and Norman Sal Norma Salter. And like I said, it started in the Northeast. And at that time, in the 1990s, at least in Vermont, the state was picking curriculums. And they had teachers in Vermont go to um, statewide workshops on um, cast to spell. So it was used pretty, 
pretty rigorous, rigorously in Vermont at that time. This is from Louisa. She said this, Louisa wrote in 1995 that the spelling patterns of English are predict predictable and logical if one takes into account several major layers of language presented in the orthography. Um, the many factors that, I'm just trying to zo zoom it out. Whoa, because I can't, there, there we go. I, I gotta get it there, okay. <laughs> the many factors that determine predictability in spelling include sound symbol relationships, syllable patterns, orthographic or spelling rules, word meaning, word derivation, where it came from, and word origin. Predictability is not an either or proposition, and she said it would be erroneous to try to classify English vocabulary in a dichotomous fashion. This was published more recently in 2015 by Luba Vangelova in The Atlantic, and she quotes this person, Marsha Bell, Masha Bell, who's the vice chair of the English Spelling Society and the author of the book, Understanding English Spelling. She analyzed the 7,000 most common English words. And by the way, there's 100,000 commonly used spell words. She analyzed only 7,000 of them. She found that 60% of them had one or more unpredictably used letters. No one knows for sure, but the Spelling Society speculates that English may just be the world's most irregularly spelled language. As a result, there's no systematic way to learn to read or write modern English. People have to memorize the spelling of thousands of individual words, file them away in their mental databases, and retrieve them when needed. This is the kind of, these are the kind of conversations that are going around and lead to why it's so difficult for teachers who believe in teaching structured language via structured phonics have such a difficult time getting through to their peers because they're being bombarded with alternate, uh, alternate realities. So who should we believe? Part of what I want you to do today is to become an educated consumer of reading research and programs. We need, you need to do it for yourself so you're a better teacher. You need to do it for your children so they become literate students um, and, and your own children and you need to do it for your students. I ended up when my kids were small um, because at that time um, they, there was a lot of whole language that I ended up having to teach them to read at home. And unfortunately, I think that happens a lot. So who do we believe basically? Well, let me t t share you a little bit about this. Dr. Louisa Motes has been a teacher, a psychologist, a researcher, graduate school faculty member. I'm guessing that you guys are fairly familiar with her. So I'm just, instead of reading all this, I'm gonna tell you some key points. She does have her doctorate in reading and human development. She um, trained interns at Dartmouth. She worked at NISHTA, which is the National Institute of um, Ch Children's Health and Development with Reed Lyon during the uh, Bush years. And they spearheaded all the research on teacher knowledge and on reading development. She continues to research and write about the need for improvements in teacher education and on helping teachers understand the language basis for reading and writing. Um, I worked under her when I, my, I went, um, I got my master's degree Degree, post master's degree at St. Michael's College in Vermont. And that's when she was a psychologist then. And she was an uh, adjunct professor at St. Mike's, as was Reed Lyon. And I just happened to be there the two years that they were there. So I got to know them quite well. We still stay in touch. So that's Louise's background. This is Luba Vagliolba's. She has a BS in systems engineering. She worked for IBM. She's a freelance writer at editor and consultant. She has an MSJ in journalism from Northwestern University. She's been an independent contractor since 2003 in the Washington area. And most of that consultation, if you look through, has been around the World Bank, Charitable Trust, Conservation International. Then she started in this year in 2020, she's founder of the hub that is a new education model that supports independent lifelong learners who want to pursue customized learning pathways in a communal setting. She has written several articles on self-directed learning. Do you see any research background there? Masha Bell, who she quoted um, in her article, she was born in Germany during World War II, 
but returned to Lithuania at age three, Lithuania. Her first language was German, but from ages seven to 15, she was educated in Lithuania and Russia. She didn't learn English till she was 14. Then she returned to Germany and began to study English. She was an au pair at age 20. Later on in life, she got a degree in philosophy and psychology. And she has, um, has 18 years of teaching English and the modern languages. Again, do you see any research background there? What about popular reading programs? Is phonics taught in those? Are these people um, researchers? It says there's a settled body of research on how best to teach early reading. But when it comes to the multitude of curriculum choices that schools have, it's hard to parse out whether well-marketed programs abide by the evidence. Many of them say they do. Many of them put on it, these are research-based programs. At this point, it's widely accepted that reading programs for young kids need to include phonics, and every one of the five programs that are listed on the side there teach about sound letter correspondences. What varies, though, is the nature of that instruction. In some cases, students master progression letter sound relationships in a set out sequence. In others, it's less systematic and all, often taught incidentally. Fontes and Pinnell LLI program, which is an intervention program for kids struggling in reading, actually has the phonology piece of that as a supplement. It's not a requirement. So who's using what? And by the way, this was December 2019 in Education Week, this article that I'm quoting to you now. So they asked the question, what curricula programs and textbooks do K2 and special education teachers use for early reading instruction? 43% use Fontes and Pinnell lever leveled literacy intervention. They 27% uh, use Journey, Houghton Mifflin's Journeys. 19% still use reading recovery, 17% um, HMH into reading, 16% units of study for teaching reading series. So where's the research? Well, I looked at the first one, Fontes and Pinnell, and the company, Fontes and Pinnell Literacy, identifies two main studies that it claims validate the program's LLI's effectiveness in grades K through two. Both are from the Center for Research and Educational Policy at the University of Memphis, and both were funded by Heinemann, who publishes LLI. Neither Fontes, and, uh, I don't think Fontes is a researcher. Pinnell does some research at the university where she is a professor. So, so what I want you to see out of this is that teaching children to read and spell is doable when you use what science has taught us, not what somebody has just decided works for a few people or a very minority of people. Why do we need to use what science has taught us? Because English has the largest vocabulary of any language. We have over 650,000 words, of which about 200,000 are in common use. When I quoted 100,000 before, it was the 100,000 most used in K2. That was my error, sorry. So here are a few words from the International Dyslexia Association. They said, and this was in um, 1995, I believe, the English spelling system is not crazy. It can be taught or unpredictable. It can be taught as a system that makes sense. Encouraging students beyond the beginning of first grade to invent, the, invent their spellings or ignore correct spelling is not constructive. It still happens and, it's not, and it shouldn't be. Classroom spelling programs should be organized to teach a progression of regular spelling patterns. After first grade, spelling instruction should follow and complement decoding instruction for reading. Children, sh children should be able to read the words in their spelling lesson. Most learners can read many, war many more words than they can spell. Understanding correspondences between sounds and letters should come first. Before spelling a word, students can orally take the sounds of the word apart. Then they can recall the letters that spell them. Next patterns, such as the six basic syllable types of English, should be taught because they represent vowel sounds in predictable ways. And then they should be taught a few basic rules. By the way, do you know how many spelling rules there are? A lot of the research people say, oh, there's too many rules to remember. There's basically four, four spelling rules. 
The rest are all, can all be taught through predictable phonetic sequences. So I made a chart for you to look at, and this is based on Louise's study um, that she did in 2000, and it was she studied the 17,000 most commonly used words. And it was first done by Hannah and his colleagues in 2001. Uh, no, later in 2001. And no, I think it was actually 1990. And then I, ch I adapted this chart in 2001. I took Louise's words and made this chart. And now she uses this chart, I think, in her letters program. So if you, the, in green, we have the level of predictability. I want you to know, go to the last column. You notice 50% of the words are, in, are predictable and consistent. And they use sound symbol correspondences that are consistent. And if you look at those examples, pen, must, that. If we teach kids initial and final consonants, initial and final blends, short vowels, and digraphs, which pretty much can be taught by for end of first grade, um, that, that will get kids 50% of the words in our language, or 325,000 words, or 100,000 of the most common. Another 36% can be gotten by predictable and frequent. And those are determined by position of a phoneme in a word. <clears throat> For example, do you know how many ways there are to spell long A? I guess I can't hear you. I, <laughs> I have to go on. There are actually eight. And the way, and this chart on the next slide, um, the way that we can do these long vowel spellings is where we by where we hear the sounds in the word. If you look at this chart, here are the spellings for long A, E, I, O, or U. One of the um, sounds for long U is missing. It got cut off when I put the slide on here. Um, end of a syllable. If you heard at the end of a syllable, it's spelled with a single vowel, A, E, I, O, or U. If it's in the middle of the word, it's got two, usually two choices. If it's at the end of a base word, it's got well, usually one choice. And then it's got four that aren't used very much. So we have four that are used a lot. And if you look at long A, the f kids have to be able to have good phonological awareness skills of where do you hear the sound in a word to be able to predict where it, um, how to spell it. So for example, if I gave you the word faint, where do you hear that long A in that? A, N, T. You hear it in the middle. Now, middle is not exact, right? Because it's, uh, there's some letters on either side, but it's not at the beginning of the word, and it's not at the end. It's not at the end of a syllable. It's in the middle of a word. So right away, I know that plain A is not a choice because it's not at the end of a syllable. I know that A, Y is not a choice because it's not at the end of a word. So it's one of these two. And then, because there's an N after it, the long A sound, it's probably going to be AI. So this chart, this is a lot for kids to try to remember. That is one thing, you know, one of the research points was there's a lot to remember, there is. So I turn this into a chart and I teach my students how to use this chart so that we fold this part back, the green part back, so that we only work on the most frequent spellings first. So if I go back to the other slide, this gray, when it says position of a phoneme in a word, initial, medial, or final, we're talking about the long vowel teams here that I just showed you from that chart. You can also get it by syllable stress, content versus content. Also phonemic environment. For example, soft C and G, um, it's not enough to know that you um, hear a soft C. You need to know what vowel comes after it. I created this song a long time ago, and I believe Louisa uses it in her workshops, and it goes like this. <clears throat> there are three vowels that soften C, E, I, E, I, Y. The same three often soften G, E, I, E, I, Y. With a S, -s here and a ch, ch there, here, S, there, ch, everywhere a soft sound. And what it basically means, if you have a C and an E, I, or Y follow it, it's going to make the soft sound. If you had, same with a G, but if you, did you notice the word with, for the soft G went like this? There are three vowels that soften C, 
E-I-E-I-Y. The same three often soften G. E-I-E-I-Y. Because we do have a few exceptions, like um, uh, get. It makes a hard G sound, and it should say J. Okay? So this phonemic environment refers to the soft C and G. In my book, I, I have that song. I have the chart. We talk about, well, if you have a hard C, um, why do we have a K? And there's a reason for that. I won't be getting into all that today, but it, all that is in the book. So letter environment means it's not enough to just look at that letter. You need to look at what comes after it. For example, think of the word biscuit. Why is there a U after the C in biscuit? It's the spelling of biscuit is B-I-S-C-U-I-T. Is that U-I a vowel team? The only reason that U is there is so that word won't say biscuit. The same is true of the word guy, G-U-Y. If that U wasn't there, it's a placeholder. If it wasn't there, it would be got a uh, jai so we have some letters some predictable reasons why those letters are there when that goes under letter environment so now between the green and the gray we have um 86 of the words which also includes those predictable but infrequent word relatives that happen early on in kids schooling so that's 86 percent of our language now the yellow which make up 10% are morphologically sensitive words. Those are the compound words. They have an affix root structure or a Latin Greek derivation, some rule-based generalizations. Now, why is this only 10%? Because I bet some of you are saying, wait a minute, there are a lot of words that have affixes, but their bases would be green or gray. So that's why it's so important to teach kids um, about prefixes and suffixes, and teach them that, that prefixes change the meaning of a word, suffixes change the part of speech. That's also in my book. Um, so we have only 4% of the words that are truly unpredictable, and they're leftovers from our Anglo-Saxon heritage. For example, the word of. Why isn't that spelled UV? Well, it's because it's derived from does anybody know? Because I can't hear you, I'm gonna to have to tell you. It comes from off. The child of Catherine is the child off Catherine. The word does is related to the word do. So it's derivational comes from that. The word father actually comes from, I can't remember if it's Greek or Latin, fader, which is related to pater, in the opposite language, which if you think of a paternity test, it's related to father. So some of those words, those words that seem really odd are either come from another country or they have a derivation that does make sense. Here's that long vowel chart again. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna have you very quickly, if you look at the first, these are the uh, 220 Dolch words, the basic words that kids um, should know. I know there's lots of word li lists out there and people teach kids to memorize these words because they call them sight words. Well, the R words we want kids to recognize very quickly, but the words term sight words has meant to some teachers that they're meant to be taught visually, memorized. And I want you to look at the one through 25 words very quickly. Okay. And I want you to quickly go down there and um, put that it is predictable, put a P or a U next to it. Or may, I think the quickest thing for you to do is to try to find the words that are unpredictable and count them on your finger. And I'll give you like two, one minute and then we'll talk about them.
Okay, ready? The. In English, it's pronounced the in England. So that is phonetic. Two, that is unpredictable because two should, that is an open syllable the way it is written. It should say toe. Okay. And predictable. He, predictable. A, I, predictable. U has two phonemes, y and U, and OU is one of the spellings of the U sound, predictable. It, of is unpredictable, as I told you. In, was, okay. WA can be um, sound like a schwa in there. It, when W comes after like in water, was, okay. It's a, depending on the dialect of it, you can, um, was actually, W with an A makes the wa sound. So that could be predictable depending on where you're from. If your dialect makes you say was, then it's not going to be. So we'll keep that one out there as a maybe. Said, we do not in our language have a word called said. We don't say he said it, we say he said it. A-I is a spelling for long A. You can't be A-Y in there because it can't come in the middle. So again, that unless you teach kids about the relationship between say and say it said, that would probably be unpredictable as three. His, predictable, that, she, four, that has two sounds, f, or, or is our control, that's predictable, on, they, they is often taught as a unpredictable word, but we have about six words in our language where EY um, makes the long sound for A. I'll go back to that chart so you can see it right here. It's not used as often. We get words like uh, curds and way and obey, but it is a predictable sound. Um, but predictable had, at, him, with, up, and all. All, believe it or not, is predictable because A, when it's followed by an L, makes an ah sound. I can walk and wall. So again, if the kids know that rule, it can be predictable. But if you want to count it as unpredictable, I'm counting those two that you have to be pretty savvy about knowing the phonetic rules, as unpredictable. If I figure that out, there's 25 words. So if I do um, 21 divided by 25, I get 84% of that first list. And if we go back here, it's pretty close to that 86, isn't it? Because we didn't do any, none of those words had affixes on them. So it's, we came up with 84%. And I've done this before through most of these lists and the average overall is about 84%. So, <clears throat> If I was doing this in person, I could tell if you're bored or confused, but I'm going to have to just assume you're not right now. Um, so English has an alphabetic orthography, and an orthography is a system of representing speech with symbols. Print, it's a writing system. An alphabetic orthography uses an alphabet or a set of symbols called letters to represent the phonemes in our language. What is the alphabetic principle? This is very, very, very important. And kids who have trouble reading do not understand this. And oftentimes teachers don't understand it. And we, ought, we don't teach what we don't know. So uh, I feel badly when teachers are doing, uh, are doing this because that sort of gives me a window into what their education has been in terms of um, teaching reading. So what the alphabetical principle is that phonemic awareness, the awareness of sounds, plus letter knowledge equals the alphabetic principle. A grapheme is the letter or a letter group that represents a phoneme. Now, in a quick turn back to this alphabetic principle, what this basically means is that we do not have a one-to-one -one correspondence between what we hear in a word and what we see. And a lot of times, if we don't tell kids that you can have uh, more than one letter representing a sound, they might write at an eight, like I ate some food, and the number eight, all the same as A-T. But if you think about that, 
How many sounds in the word at? At. Two. How many graphemes? A and T. Two. How many letters? A and T. Two. The word ate, like I ate my dinner. How many sounds? A, T, two. How many graphemes? Two. Because the E is is the E goes kind of with the A, the A sound E, so that's two. How many letters? Three. And the word for the number eight, how many sounds? Eight, two. How many graphemes? Two. How many letters? Five. If we don't teach kids that you can have more than one letter representing a sound, then they're going to try to read eight as igata because they're thinking they have for every letter there's a sound. Also, the word I put up here is boing. And the reason I chose that word is that one of the things I disagree with Barbara Wilson about is she teaches the NG as a welded sound. So she teaches ing, ong, ang, ung as a one sound that when kids graph it, they put it in one sound and it's not. And, and it leads to confusion because you get boing Kids will try to call it Boeing because they, they know that it's, they think it's welded. And that same thing happens in the word sang. They will often write S-A-I-N-G. So N-G is a grapheme. I-N-G is two graphemes, I and N-G. Um, so we, our English orthography is complex. We have 40 phonemes or sounds. We have 26 letters. We have more than 250 graphemes that represent those 40 phonemes. There were about eight spellings for each of the um, five vowels plus the sixth one for sort you. That's 48 grapheme sets right there before we get to all the variant vowels and the um, TCHs and the GGEs and all those different ones. Unlike math, there's not always a one-to-one phoneme graphing correspondence in our English language, and X is a perfect example. X is one letter, but it makes two sounds. If you say X without A, you get X. I still go in classrooms and see people still have a xylophone up there. And X makes the Z sound in, I think, five words in our language. They should be having a word like axe or fox with the A crossed out so that kids know that it's the end of the sound. Um, I've taught for over 40 years and as a special ed teacher and a regular ed teacher. And I have found, and I'm, the research bears out, that there are many more boys that have difficulty learning to read than girls. We also have many more boys that are better in math, not so much as it used to be, than girls. And I believe that one of the reasons they're so confused about reading is that they, the one-to-one -one correspondence in math is always true. If you have one apple, there's, it's one. If you have one piece of pizza, it's one. If you have four pencils, it's four. If you have four balls, it's four. Always four. It doesn't change. And it does change in, re in reading. And that's why it's very important that you teach kids early on and point out that more than one letter can stand for a sound has two letters, but it makes one sound. We have five principles of orthography that Louisa um, put out for us in 2002. We spell letters and letter combinations. We do not spell phonetically. It's another myth that teachers will say, he's already had too much phonics. Look at this writing. He's already, he's overusing phonics. No, he's not. He's writing down what he hears. And and because he doesn't know that sometimes what you hear doesn't match with what you see, he's spelling like that. We spell by the position of a sound in a word. That's the long vowel patterns like I showed you. We spell by letter patterns. J and V never end a word. There, there's not one word in the English language that ends in V. K, J, and Y are never doubled. We spell by meaning, heal, and health. It's a lot easier to hear the long E in heal than in health. In um, cur courageous, you can hear that A-G-E, but you can't encourage. So having kids learn about the derivatives of those can, is, can help with spelling. Many English words and spelling patterns come from other language. For example, antique and crash come from French. So 
You want to start with a systematic sequence of phonic, phonemic awareness and phonic skills when you're teaching reading and spelling. It's very, very important before kids can be successful in either reading or phoneme graphing mapping. They've got to be able to isolate initial consonants and isolate final consonants, isolate medial vowels, sound words. They also need to know um, the consonant letters and you should begin with the continuant sounds. Mmm, st, before you work on voiced and unvoiced sounds. You should lear learn the short vowels and if you notice the order, whoops I should have had a short over that, um, that these are in a different order. Why did I change the order? E is the most difficult to hear. A is the easiest, and this is the order here. Um, consonant digraphs and beginning blends. So why should syllables be taught then? Okay, if you're telling me about sounds and consonants, why should syllables be taught? More than 80% of the words in, our, in English have more than one syllable, more than 80%. It's much easier to read a new unfamiliar word in chunks it's less taxing for our short-term memory than reading sound by sound, word missing. It's easier and more accurate to spell a long word in syllable chunks rather than trying to remember all the letters separately. Um, when I was teaching and I gave the kids multisyllabic words for spelling, instead of a word being all right or all wrong, I gave them credit for the syllables they spelled correctly. And that encouraged them to actually practice spelling their words in syllables. Um, as children progress through school, many subject words, particularly in the sciences, have um, long words with Latin or Greek origins. All students, including secondary and university students, benefit from learning how to read and spell using syllables as it, as it improves speed and fluency. When I was getting my master's degree at the University of Vermont, I worked in the reading lab and I ran the college reading improvement program. And most of the people who came to see me were kids in the pre-med program. And they were obviously very smart um, and they had gotten by to college, through to college, by being able to memorize a lot of words. And when they finally came to me, it was because they couldn't keep up to the mass, with the massive amounts of reading because they were still trying to read by context and getting a lot more of those science words, it was more difficult to do. And actually, after about second grade text, it's, you only get about two out of every 10 words by context. And that's been a method that's been used a long time, teaching con to read contextually. So what is the syllable? <clears throat> it's a group of letters that contain one vowel sound. Do not ask kids to, do not teach kids that a syllable is a group of letters that contain one vowel. That is not true. Ran has one vowel and one vowel sound. Rain has two vowels you see, but one vowel you hear. Okay. The number of vowels in a word does not equal the number of syllables. The number of vowel sounds in a word equals the number of syllables. And identifying the vowel pattern, the syllable type in a word, makes it easier to decode and spell it. I've had lots of kids who can't tell you the definition of, say, an R-controlled syllable, which is kind of required in Orton Millingham, but they are able to understand what it is and what it does. And so I've sometimes, instead of having them name it, I'll say, what is the vowel pattern? And they might say, they, then they'll say closed or, because they respond to that better than they do what is the name of that syllable sometimes. So we use those interchangeably. There are six syllable types. We are only going to work on the close today with phoneme graphing, graphing mapping. I mean, I take, teach this in two days, not in one hour, but I'm going to give you a taste of what it is. Um, and you'll see why I've chosen close to be able to do that. But the six syllable types are closed, open, silent E, vowel team, R controlled, consonant LE. Our language is made up of these six syllable types. And the six syllable types with the addition of a schwa syllable. For example, in the word ago, that's made up of two open syllables. The first one is a schwa open syllable. Um, in closed, we might get um, 
So I'm trying to think of one would be good. Um, let me think of one. In um, in president, for example, again, you've got a sound in the middle that's an open syllable, but it's making that schwa sound. So each one of these can be a schwa. You can have a closed schwa, an open schwa, a silent schwa. So it is important to teach the schwa. <clears throat> so what is a detached syllable and why bother with them? Well, a detached syllable is a syllable that's been detached or, or taken from a real word. Detached syllables are combined to make real words in our language, so it's preferable to using nonsense words, which you catch a lot of flack for with some teachers because they say, what does that do to, you know, um, kids reading are not real words anyways. Detached syllables follow predictable phonetic patterns. If a student is given a strong foundation in the alphabetic principle where they connect sounds with letters through real detached syllables, more advanced words won't deter them. So, for example, if they learn lat and tox, that will let them uh, eventually get to larger words with latitude and toxic. There's a lot of research that supports that if a child is able to get the first syllable in a word, they are much more able to get the entire word. But that's not true when you have kids who get the first letter in a word and then they look at the last letter in a word and they kind of guess the middles. So the difference is that by using syllables, they're at least getting an initial vowel sound that can help them predict what the word will be. I use detached syllables assessments as formative assessments. And the reason I do that is that oftentimes I'm testing kids who are eighth graders having difficulty reading. And by that time, they've amassed a lot of words they know by sight that they might not necessarily be able to spell or might not necessarily recognize within a multi-syllabic word. So since many children have excellent memories, they're able to memorize those one-syllable words without understanding how they connect with their letters. My son was a perfect example. He came home from kindergarten one year and says, Mom, I don't want to go to school anymore. I already know my ba ba bas because they were using distar at the time. And he was already reading like when he was three and a half. And by first and second grade, he was really reading. But you know where it showed up that he didn't, like it was in his spelling. He was like 99th percentile in reading when they tested him in second grade, but his spelling was only in the third percentile. It didn't take him very long once, you know, I, we, I explained to him about the way spelling match um, relates to um, the sounds and the letters you see, but you know, he was a smart cookie, but if you went through your whole life with no one explaining that to you, I, it could be a pretty significant problem. Um, so if you use detached syllables when they're eventually introduced to multi-syllabic words that don't contain their memorized words, um, the child would be lost, but you can assess their knowledge through an authentic detached syllable system and that's can off test and it can offer a window. And this is the one I use. I want to stop you. We've got, it's quarter two, just to make sure you know. The okay. Time. Yep. We're going to go fast. We're getting there. Okay. Um, so this is a detached syllable. And if you will notice each one of this is open syllables, silent E, excuse me, closed syllables, silent E, open, regular vowel team, variant vowel teams, R controlled, um, consonant LE. And this is a combination of Detached syllables in the middle with real prefixes and suffixes. These two make up multi the multisyllabic part of the test. These are the words. I wanted to just to show you that each one of them does come from a real word. Ix comes from the word Ixora, which is a sun-loving shrub in Florida. A yashmak is a veil. So these are there are real words. Um, this is what the syllable looks like. Um, we gave it to all of our incoming third graders, um, the teachers and the special educators shared giving it. We would circle the errors that they have, come up with a total, and then it would tell us what we needed to teach the kids. So if you look here, this is the multisyllabic part. The word is Miss Crochley. So here, if they, if they missed Miss, you'd circle it. If they missed this, you'd miss it. And then when you get down below, it totals what kind of syllables you need to teach them. And this is the front sheet. So this was the single syllable part and the total test part. And we gave it three times a year, beginning, middle, um, and end. And we used some four tiers of intervention. 
So the, the kids in purple in tier one received a syllable-based spelling program in the classroom that I created with the teachers. And um, so the teachers, in the beginning, I team taught it with them, and then a gradual release of responsibility, they taught it themselves. The gold group was kids who got um, more syllable instruction um, during their spelling time from the teacher. The last two tiers were um, done usually outside the classroom. Um, tier three was done with trained paraeducators, and four was usually a special educator. And we used the data like this. And I just want to point out a couple of things. I'm going to try to go fast. This particular child actually went back to class after um, they got some help in the class. Basically, their problem was phonological awareness. This is a phoneme segmentation test, 25 percent. And he had only had trouble with a three vowel. Uh, three syllable patterns. He got those in the class. She got those in the classroom and went back. This child stayed a little longer. Blue is tier three. At the beginning, didn't really have a sense. Knew a lot about single syllable words. Didn't know how to apply those single syllables to multisyllabic words. And also, you know, by third grade, they should be 100% for phoneme segmentation, and they weren't. So this is how we kept track of them, and gradually the, po the key was to try to dismiss them back to the classroom. So what is the most common spelling unit in English? It's a closed syllable. It accounts for just under 50% of the syllables in running text. Short vowels, initial and final consonants, blends and digraphs are both predictable and consistent, and when they're taught, they allow off you to kids to access 50% of the 65,000 words in our language, or 100,000 words of the most common. So what's a closed syllable? It has just one vowel, um, and that is almost always short. It's a syllable that ends with one or more consonants. Now, you some kids will think that it's, I asked a kid once what a, a closed syllable was, or what a syllable was, and they told me every group of three letters because they had only seen CVC words. But it doesn't have to be a CV word, CVC words. It is a closed syllable. So it's important that you give them syllables that have more, uh, more or less than three letters when you're teaching about closed syllables. The consonants serve as a gate that closes off the end of the syllable to keep it short. You want to expose students to two, four, and five letter closed syllables. I just told you that. And once you've taught them closed syllables, you should get, right away teach them to put closed syllables together to make um, two syllable words. And remember, closed syllables make up 50% of running, words in running text. <clears throat> so what is phoneme graphy mapping? It begins with sound segmentation and it ends with conventional orthography. It ends with the way the word really looks in print. It provides explicit multi-sensory instruction in the alphabetic principle. Its units of instruction are focused around the six syllable types. It results in dramatic gains in conventional spelling and decoding. We have that um, over time. I, for the last 12 years, we've kept all that data on those and the kids in our classrooms. We had over uh, 300 kids a year, the data on 300 kids a year. It makes linguistic principles more concrete and easier for students and teachers to recognize. It starts with sound and then it goes to print. It has the same sequence. Uh, the sequence for the alphabetic stage is single consonants, short vowels, digraphs, the spelling rule for floss, aud cons consonant oddities, blends, same as in many programs. Very, it's very important to when you teach short vowels to use undistorted keywords. Don't use igloo, which I see in classrooms still. It sounds like long E. Elephant begins with the letter name L. Elephant. That's another thing. When you have a kid who spells um, the word belt, B-L-T, that's a signal that they're still confused between the name of the letter and the sound it makes. Egg sounds like a long A, don't use it. Indian and umbrella have nasal sounds, so it's very hard, it distorts the vowel. Um, if you don't believe me, take your fingers and stick them out behind your nose and say, make the short A sound. And then when you get to your nose, pinch it when you make the N sound. Ready? And, and, it's the nasal that is making that and sound like and, okay? 
It's easier for children to learn their short, short vowels if you introduce them with keywords. Um, so I do something called pulling vowels. I'm going to do with you right now. I found that's the best way to teach kids this, to give them not just the keys, but you want them to hear the sound long enough so they can start to distinguish it. So stick your hand out like you have an apple in front of it, and you're going to say, ah, and when you get to your mouth, you're going to swallow the pull. So it's like this, ah, ah. Same for octopus, but we use this. Ah, ah, itch, itch, up, up, echo, echo. And you don't teach them all on one day. I would teach short A and short O and give them some not, um, detached syllables like Ottoman or words they don't know. And you want, when you're first teaching short vowels, you only want to give them words where the, con the vowel is first, not embedded when you're teaching these. I explain that in the book and there's some alphabet bingo game, um, short vowel bingo games in there that are made up that you can use. So if we start Phoneme graphing starts with blocks, red and yellow. Red is, or if you have two other colors, it's fine, but you have to designate one as the vowel. And I'm using red as the vowel because they're so important, okay? And it starts with, first you ask kids, I'm gonna give you a word, and they don't, they don't see these words right at the beginning. You try to choose some words that they might have seen in their spelling, or you wanna see what you can get from them without them seeing it first, okay? The word is act. So how many sounds do you hear? This is what you hear. At. And I would say then, what do you hear? Ah. What do you write? A. What do you hear? T. What do you write? Whoops. <laughs> T. Okay. Odd. What do you hear? Whoops. I'm sorry. Did that wrong. Whoops. This should not be red. <laughs> should be yellow. Okay. Odd. What do you hear? Ah. D. Okay. What do you hear? Ah. What do you write? Oh. And I and I use those two. Some as you get older, you can say what's the phoneme, what's the grapheme. When I'm teaching teachers, I do use those words. But for little kids, I use what do you hear? What do you write? So what do you hear? Ah, what do you write? Oh, what do you hear? D, what do you write? Now, in this case, they might put one there and we'll say, well, we spell this one with two Ds or might've been on their spelling list or on their reading list. So they might've seen it to begin with. I just meant where this activity, try to not have them so they can see them or you have them cover it and then they can flip it over and see and say, well, what's different? Well, sometimes we have two letters, but we only hear one sound from them. Okay. Um, y is a consonant. When Y comes at the beginning of a word or syllable, it represents a consonant sound, like in yes, you, yard, yellow. Y is a very busy letter because it's a consonant, but it also can be a vowel. And do you know how many sounds it has as a vowel? I wouldn't teach it here but I'm, to kids, but I'm gonna teach you. Um, it, it, it can be in a single syllable word, it says I like in my. And in um, other words, the Y makes also, uh, can sound like a short I, like in myth and um, type. So the laziest vowel actually in the alphabet is short I because it gets, or the letter I, because it gets the Y to sneak in there several times. And then Y at the end of a multi-syllable word says E, like in happy, funny, mommy. But we just, in the beginning with the little kids, you're just gonna teach about the consonant Y. Um, it's like in yes and yo-yo. So what about consonant oddities? Well, we have Q-U and it represents the two phonemes, K, and w, w, I don't say, it's not w, w, as in queen and quilt in the initial and medial positions of words. What I didn't cover with you, which I do when I'm teaching the class, is what all the different consonant sounds make. 
It's very, very important that when you teach kids cat sounds that you do not put a schwa on them. Do not say ba. It's do not say t. It's t. Do not say m. It's m. Because kids, that uh that you're adding is actually sounds like a short u. So that's why when they go to write belt, they'll go b b u l t. So it's very very important that you clip that those schwas and then it's it's and woof. Um, in our written language, Q is never seen with, when the, our written English language, Q is never seen without a U following it. So it's treated as a consonant partnership. And this is how we do it. In the word quit, what do you hear? Now notice, when we go to spell, U is a vowel. But in this word, is it acting like a vowel or is it acting like a consonant? It's acting like a consonant, so it's yellow. I, t. Okay. What do you hear? K. What do you write? What do you hear? I have to do something here, so. Okay. What do you hear? Oh. And what do you write? Whoops, put it too far. What do you hear? I. What do you write? What do you hear? T. What do you write? Now, now, how do I show that these are partners? I put them close to the line, as you saw, and then I'm going to try to do a line here, squiggly line. But I have the kids circle this so they see what that partnership is. Okay. I just noticed this is missing a letter. Um, okay, oh, that's why it's there. It was there just. Okay, so we're gonna do quick right now. What do we hear? I. Now, kids will be able to see here that we have, what do we hear? K. What do we hear? Oh, but we write you. I. What do we hear? K. And how do we spell K? At the end of a one syllable word right after a short vowel, we spell it a CK. So, right away, here we get again, we have that alphabet of principle where you can have two letters but one sound. And these need to be pushed over. On a smart board, I can do this by hand. It's to, for this presentation, I had to do it this way. Okay, so that's how you do QU. X is the only grapheme in our language that represents two phonemes. It can say k and s, or it can say g and z. I usually teach the k sound first, and I tell them about that it can say g and z, but most of the time, X says k. And I use this with the kids. X says this, k, s. So you're making an X with their hand, two sounds, k, s. They're not doing this, they're doing and making the X in the air so that they know that it's two sounds. So you have students delete the first phoneme in the keyword ax. So say ax, say ax without a. X. The final two phonemes remain. To show that the phoneme, the grapheme X is rep comprised of two sounds, it's mapped across two boxes. So what do we hear? What do we hear? Ah. What do we hear? K -s. It gets, why does it get two boxes? Because it makes two sounds. You do not put it in one box and draw an X through it. it, it you put it in two boxes so it lets the kids know that it's two sounds and they actually love making these. It's never followed by an S in our language. Do you know why? Because the, the X has a S sound in it. So when kids write exit, E-K-S-I-T, 
I know that they haven't learned yet that X has an S in uh, a sound built into it. So how do we do it? Um, what do you hear? Ah. Uh, what do you hear? K. S. What do you write? Ah. Uh, what do you hear? And I am going to have to draw this. And go. Tux, the same tux would be, what do I hear? T a k s. Now, this is the alphabetic principle in reverse, because this time we have three sounds and only two letters. In this one, we have four sounds, but only three letters. So what do I hear in tux? I hear t. What do I hear? Uh. So I'll say, what do you hear? Uh. What do I write? You. What do I hear? K. What do, and what do I hear? S. K. S. And what do I write? And we'd write, put an X in there. Consonant digraphs can be easy to learn. There are two consonants that when put together stand for a sound that's entirely different. For example, Sh does not say saha. Ch does not say kaha. Ph does not say p. These all have one sound. These also make one sound. Why do we have a T in TCH? Do you know why? Well, if you had a word like punch, and you, uh, it, it, it was P-U-N-T-C-H. You'd have like four consonants strung together, which you don't usually have. This, these two spellings are used when these, when the sound of J and the sound of Ch is directly after a short vowel sound. That is one of those four spelling rules that's in the book. So what, how do we do this? Um, let's do flux just because it's got a digraph and that X in it. I always try when I teach, make up a list for kids that I put words on here that are what we've already learned and also that contain the new sounds. So in the word flux, what do you hear? Are you, I hope you guys are saying this as I'm doing it. Ah. What do I hear? What do I, whoop. Yep, I did that. What do I write? This time it's going to be a P and an H because that's one sound. What do I hear? Ooh. What do I write? What do I hear? Ah. What do I write? I'm using caps so you can see them, but I could use smaller letters. What's the, what do I hear at the end of flux? I hear k, s, and I'm going to go up here. K, and I got to do it again because it won't let me. S, and so you say to the kids, when you, then you can flip over the word, uh, card with flux on it. You can say, how many letters do you see? I, how many sounds? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, now what, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So again, they see that the one-to-one -one correspondence isn't there. This is a, this, by kids doing this, it gives you a really good window on what they are understanding and what they need more practice with. Um, we do phoneme graphing max exercises when I give their spelling list the first day and the second day and um, a little each of the other days, but not as much. Um, that lesson is explained in the book. Um, I'm going to, we're almost done. I have only 61, I think. So the digraph NG, um, it can be confusing for children in early elementary grades. Many teachers teach it as a suffix ending before discussing um, 
the two phonemes in this well-used word ending, okay? Without this understanding, you often see the following misspellings. I already talked to you about this. They do boing for being. They do rang for R-A-I-N-G for rang. So when we do it, it obviously, it, you, what do you hear in sang? It's ah, mm. We have four letters. We're gonna have three graphemes. What's the, I hear, so what do I write? What do I hear? Ah, what's the phone, grapheme? A, what do I hear? What's the phoneme, I hear a phoneme? Mm. It's not mm, but it's mm. Plug your nose and try to make that sound. Mm. You can't because it's got an N in it and you can't make a nasal sound when your nose is plugged. Kids like that. I tell them it makes like a lion sound. We go, mm, like the big lion, mm, for NG. We practice making that. We talk about what it feels like when you make it, um, what it sounds like, and we do the whole nasal thing with the NG. So what's the grapheme from mm? It's NG. These are not two graphemes. This is one grapheme. More than one letter can be in a grapheme. Um, when is it spelled N, with, spelled with an N? After a hard K or a hard G. That's why kids spell think like this, because they hear mm -mm. In think it's th, I, mm, k. They do hear it. And so if they spell it like this, it's not because they're over phonics. It's because if they haven't been taught that N can sometimes sound like an NG before, <clears throat> a K, a hard K, or a hard G. That's explained in the book in detail. And the way the book is set up, it says what the teacher needs to know. So I explained to you what I'm telling you right now. And then it tells you, gives you words on how to teach it to the kids. And then it gives you examples of each. Um, and it will give you an example of how to map them. So if I'm going fast here and you have something you want to know more about and you have the book you can go um, look up in the table of contents and go and find more specifics on it so how would we map that bank it goes like this whoops did it wrong sorry right yeah me yeah, i did but ah uh, i get mixed up my colors sometimes but ah uh, mm, so what do i hear what do I write? B, what do I hear? Ah, what do I write? What do I hear? Bang, what do I hear? Bang, I hear, mm. In this case, I'm just gonna put an N mm because if I did this, they know that doesn't always look right after a period of you telling them that you hear it, but you don't write it. So you need to think sounds, not letters. When the grapheme N, whoop, and I put this on the on your wall too. No, there's never an NGK or an NGG. Um, where it went. Okay. Um, when the grapheme N makes the sound of the digraph um, the letter in N remains in a single box since it represents a single sound. Written phonetically, banquet looks like this, even though it looks like. But at um, quit. Um, it looks like there should be an, it sounds like there should be an NG there. So what about blends? Two or more consonant letters can stand for a blend as in clock, swim, and split. Unlike, unlike digraphs, they retain their individual sounds. Some are easier to hear in blends than others. You start with sound when introducing this concept. I have kids. I would like you all, and it's easier if you close your eyes so that you're not distracted by what things look like. I would like you to close your eyes, and I would like you to say fat without at. How many movements in your mouth? One. Now I'd like you to say flat, and very slowly say flat without at. How many movements in your mouth? Two, where was the first one? Try it again, say flat without at. 
It's at the front of your mouth. Where is the second one? It's at the top, full. You, if you have kids experiment with how a blend feels in their mouth, they will be able to tell you whether there's two sounds or one sound there. Because they often leave out one of the sounds because they smash together so quickly that unless you spend some time having them separate them auditorily, then they'll still continue to write them. Um, also, um, the onset rhyme part really works well when you're trying to teach um, short vowels and blends. Kids who have trouble blending, um, I have them start with the vowel and the final consonants or blend that come after it. So if the word was black, I would have them auditorily first say ack and then add black because otherwise you might get b, b, ack. So it's a lot easier for kids to blend if they start with the onset rhyme when you're first teaching them how to do that. Um, so how do we um, do this? Let's try sprang. What do I hear? What's the second phoneme? Third phoneme? Spur. Fourth phoneme? Ah. Fifth phoneme? Mm. What do I hear? S. What do I write? S. What's the second phoneme? What do I write? P. Phoneme, R. Grapheme, R. Phoneme, A. Grapheme, A. Phoneme, um. Grapheme, N, G. Notice that I'm saying, what do you hear? What do you write? Then gradually you wanna switch to what's the phoneme, what's the grapheme for older kids anyways. What do you hear? What do you write? Now, when I ask kids, what do I, they hear? And they say S, I will immediately say, that's a letter. And then that cues them to make the sound. That's gonna happen a lot in the beginning. And it's very important that you call them on it in a nice way so that they start to recognize the difference between a sound and the letter that represents that sound. Uh, after you've done all of the, Short vowels, blends, digraphs, those 50% of, gets you 50% of the words. You wanna have the kids practice um, combining, these are real detached syllables into words. So you can do it, um, Wilson has these cards already made. So you have, the, you have them take a first syllable and connect it with a second syllable to make words. Okay, 100, you get how to do that. That's very important that they have practice with two syllable, closed syllable words, two closed syllables, I mean, so that they don't just start to see like that little boy, oh, it has, every syllable has three letters in it. So this is it. <laughs> so I know I went fast because I didn't want to do, we're already 16 minutes behind, but this is what my note would look like for you. Thank you for Zooming with us tonight and stay safe. I thank you for um, putting up with it. And I, I will take some questions. I, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to do this or not, Donna, but I figured you might get some questions about where to get the book. So this was not in the PowerPoint that you sent everybody, um, but it's here anyways. Um, on the, I added that slide today. Okay, great. Um, I wasn't sure. I, I know I read something about you don't advertise products, but I, but I know people would probably ask for it if they didn't have it. So, but but we 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 do advertise products because it's oh. okay if they're good. Okay. okay. So, um, yeah, we talked about this at the beginning. So this is, again, you can get it right through um, Sopris Sopris West. No, it's actually Sopris West was bought by Cambium Learning. See that? Um, okay. See the uh, email down below. Yes, it says customer service at cambiumlearning.com. Uh, okay, because it still says Sopris West on the book. So, okay, good to know. They, they haven't changed that yet. Um, by the way, Cambium Learning, you guys probably know more about them than you think because they are actually the authors of A to Z Learning. Have you ever heard of A to Z Learning? No. Anyone? Have you? I'm sure. Uh, Donna? No, I haven't. 
it's, is it? It's it's wonderful. It, it's um, A to Z learning. Basically, they have it for reading. They have it for spelling. They have it for science. They it's all leveled. So if you have a struggling reader and they're reading um, kindergarten level, you can go on there and you can print out um, a paper book at a level and they have both fiction and nonfiction and it also comes with lessons and each lesson has phonics work with it. It's, a, it's very good and you can get a free trial. It's called A to Z Learning. Is it decodable readers at the beginning? They have some decodable readers. If they have so many things, they have decodable readers. They have, um, then they have um, easy text according to font. They have phonics books. So if you say you're learning digraphs, then you can print off a, S a book that has mostly SHs in them. Nice. Also, it come, um, Raz Kids is one of the things on A to Z readers. So once the kids get reading, um, you can the teachers can plug into what level the reading is. Um, I'm is familiar and the kids Raz can go on there and practice. Yeah. What did you say? I'm familiar with Raz Kids. Yeah, um, it, they, they publish Raz Kids. It's called A to Z Reading, and it's very good. Or Learning A to Z, someone mentioned? Learning A to Z is the website, but um, okay. you can do, they have reading, and I've used the science one for younger kids, too. They, they, they just, like, for example, if you were doing Martin Luther King and you had a child in third grade, uh, or fourth grade, who, let's say fifth grade, who was reading like at a third grade level, and you had a kid in that classroom who was reading at an eighth grade level, they have three different levels of that book with the same information in it. Mm -hmm. So the classroom teachers can teach about Martin Luther King, all the kids would get the same information, but the materials are at their instructional level. Mm -hmm. So someone just commented the leveled readers are much less appropriate for emerging readers. Right. Yeah. Right. But they do have emergent readers on there and they have um, predictable readers and they have phonetic readers. Okay. So they have all kinds of things and they all, and they also list them by um, Fontes Fennell level, um, the um, readability levels. They, they list it three different ways, the DRA levels. So whatever your school is using. I'm, I'm not, I'm, they're not paying me anything to plug it. It's just one of the things that I found very useful, especially um, for my paraeducators and classroom teachers when the mm -hmm. kids were reading so far below some of the other kids, they still got an opportunity to use materials that um, within the classroom that was more appropriate for them okay. than having to remake something all the time. So, so we have a couple questions about your assessment. Okay. You Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how. <laughs> sure. Okay. Can you let's, see me? Let's go. Um, I cannot see you, but I will find you. I'm trying to see if I do. There you are. That, oh, that didn't do it. Okay. I see you now. Can everyone see you? I think everyone can. Somebody wanted me to sing the song again. Someone liked the song. Yes, we liked your song. Does she have? Does the person have the book? Because it's in the book. Um, what page is it on? Do you know? Um, just a minute. Ow. I should know. <laughs> Seventy-three, I think. 74. 74. 74. <laughs> oh, I see. I'll type out the words for everybody. <laughs> and, you know, they remember the EIY because it's kind of like McDonald's. E I E I Y. You know? <laughs> so it's E I E I O, but we're doing E I Y. Is the assessment in the book? No. I'm looking through these questions here. Um, what did you say about the assessment that you were thinking you were going to? Are you? you if people are if people are interested in the assessment, I I have to make a few um, changes in the data sheet because some of the numbers didn't align. Um, 
but and then I could I could sell copies to people if they're really interested in it. Um, I just haven't put it to the publisher yet. Okay. Okay. So I don't know how the best way is to do that. That my email is on the front sheet of that presentation. Oh, I see a lot of people like the assessment. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, yes. People want to know when you're going to do your two day workshop. Two days? Oh, <laughs> you mean people would really want to sit for eight hours? Yes, I think so. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, you know what? We could split it up into four half days. To make it yeah. more and Do easier. it just mornings or afternoons, but they'd have to be during a time they're um, not in school, right? Spring break. What? Break. Spring break. I can't hear. Spring break, she said. Oh, spring break. Okay. Um, hmm. Where the heck did that go? Just a sec. Um, spring break, April. I could try that. I actually would be going to South Carolina. <laughs> um, why don't I guess I'll leave it up to Donna to sort of get some I some um, dates or times, or we could do, you know, a couple hours in the evenings of two, for two weeks or something. Why don't I send out a survey to everyone and see okay. what you would like to do? Do you want to break it up? which is not a bad idea because people want to assimilate this. It takes a long time to take it all in and start applying. Right. Um, is that how long it takes? Is that the two days to get through your book? Yeah. Okay. And so, I think it would be a lot easier if people had the book. I think I would make that a requirement and mm -hmm. don't think, I mean, I make like $3 on each book. So it's no big, <laughs> it's no big thing for me. It's just easier for people to have it. Then I can, you can see the examples and ask questions in it. And mm -hmm. All right. So we can talk about that. Somebody just said they all over have spring breaks. I don't, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing it in a, uh, January and February at night times because it's pretty cold in Vermont <laughs> before I go. So, right. well, we could talk about that. We could set that up and do evenings. Um, like, can you do like two hours? Would we'll talk about like you know a, I don't know that. So would this would be an eight hour, sixteen hour workshop you normally do. Well, with questions and stuff. It could be, but we could we could try to do it shorter and then add to it or something. I don't. Um, okay, so let's. You and I could. You and I should talk, Donna. Yeah. Could, outside okay. of this. All right. Um, so someone wants to know schwa. I haven't. People don't understand what schwa is. Okay. Schwa is a ver a murmur vowel, and basically it's not long and it's not short. It's kind of like a. Uh, sound and it, it's very prominent at the end of a lot of our states so that's kind of the best way to remember how to say it like atlanta georgia louisiana alaska it's that uh sound at the end and it can come in the middle so like president so that's an open schwa um i'm trying to think of some long some vowel teams that have it but it's that us uh, sound and you'll be surprised when you teach kids about that um they they that actually helps them a lot if you teach them it's a murmur vowel so sometimes it's not if it's not long or short it's probably going to be a murmur vowel and oftentimes it is an a um so and they love to schwazize by they put an upside down e around the letter we call it schwazizing it. So does that help? And it's usually in an, an accent syllable. Thank you, Karen. So Atlanta, Atlanta, Alaska, it's at the end. I find that kids and adults have a very difficult time with accenting and unaccented un and accented syllables. I mean, you can get it for produce and produce, but 
for Alaska, it's like, okay, I hear the uh, uh, a little bit sharper than the other two, but for some kids, it's very hard. Oh, you're, you can use the template for the mapping. Yeah, it's basically, I created that mapping sheet on a um, Microsoft, I think they're inch boxes. And mm -hmm. the best chips that I, I don't, I use some red and yellow blocks, but those went fast um, with, with the kids. But you can use from, it's, I can't remember the name of the math company, but they're red and yellow chips and yeah. you flip them. They're yellow on one side and red on the other. And those seem to work a lot better because then the kids can, you just say, I want you to flip three of them over to yellow instead of having to continuously count out three yellow and three red. But I still left the squares rather than the circles. That was the other question people had. Um, do difference between C and K. Real quick, the difference between C with K or do you want to know when, why we have a K in our language? I think that's probably what you meant. Okay, very quickly, write down some words, or, or tell me what these words all have in common. Um, karate, kangaroo, Congo, koala, um, kudo. Those are all K-O, K-U, K-A words, right? So why don't we have a C in front of that instead of a K? It's because they're non-American words. And if we used a C instead of a K in King, and it was C-I-N-G, how would you have to pronounce that? Sing. Because a C with an I makes it soft. So we use the we use a K in front of an E I and Y if we have a sound, so we know that it it's um it retains the softness. Otherwise, it would become a harder sound. Does that help? Okay, one more thing. Um, uh, Jessica, did I answer your question? Because I see you said it was so fast. <laughs> I think that was her. Question. Um, do you happen to have a video of your lessons of doing um, phoneme graphing mapping with a student? I do somewhere. I, I would have to get them from, I, I work for the Stern Center for Language and Learning and they have published this um, program. Um, I can't remember what it was renamed it. And they, they feature me in that program and they also did some videos that I can get from the I'll try to get from the Stern Center. That see people really it's called mind play mind play and it's actually an online class that teaches all about reading and one whole section is my stuff. Okay well maybe that might be something I am that's a three credit class. Yeah, I think it's a three credit online class and it's through the Stern Center for Language and Learning and we'll I can give you that information. So we'll have to include that. Maybe that's a thought to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I can call um, Blanche this week and ask her for copies of the videos. Okay, that would be wonderful. Yes, they have me teaching the short vowels I think, and they have me um, Doing, I have this large letter game that I play with the kids. They have me doing that and doing some phonography mapping. Okay, one more question and we'll call it a night. Can you please okay. repeat the four spelling rules from the beginning of the presentation? Repeat them? Mm -hmm. Okay. One is uh, the, the variant spellings K versus CK, GE versus DGE, CH versus TCH. That's one spelling rule because it's the, the same rule applies. If there's a short vowel for any of those sounds, you use the extra letter combo. So ack, short A, A-C-K, ick, awk, use the C-K, fudge, grudge, you're going to use D-G-E. But if you have cringe, there's an N in there, so you won't. So those, those I, that, they, I can't teach you that too quickly, but that's one of the rules. The second rule is um, drop the final E. 
the doubling rule, and change the Y to I. Okay. All right, Catherine, you did a great job. We still have 162 people on. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you t send me some of your qu questions, I can try to answer them. I don't always look at my Learning Roots account, but I'll get better. <laughs> um, I'll get better at it. I, just so you guys know, I've been kind of out of commission for a little while because I had to have some major surgery the last three years, so four years actually. So this is I'm just getting back to this. <laughs> so thank you for being patient. Thank you so much. It was You're great. welcome. So we'll Good talk, Donna. Time. We will talk. Okay, another day? Yeah, let's call okay. it. Okay. Thanks for organizing this. You're welcome. Thanks for okay. doing it. <laughs> Maybe we won't have the Zoom problem next time. <laughs> Hopefully, right? <laughs> yeah. We'll get better. Okay, bye. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.